It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Manoush Zamarodi. And today, part two of our series, Work, Play, Rest. We're examining the fundamental ways that we spend our time and how they're changing, including what it means to play. And we're going to start with some music. This is from a performance on the TED stage in 2017. Listening to this performance, you might not guess that all of these instruments are being played by one single musician who is practically leaping across the stage. He's here for a second on the drums, then suddenly he's upright at his bass and then over to the keyboard. And he is just totally joyous, playful. That musician is Jacob Collier. What's up, everyone? <laughs> hey, we were just talking about you. Yeah, what, what's this I'm hearing? Oh, you know, what's this the usual. <laughs> Why don't, let's start by having you introduce yourself. Tell us your name and what you do. So, hello. <laughs> My name is Jacob. I'm from North London. I am a multi-instrumentalist, uh, so I play a few different instruments, and I'm also a producer and a songwriter and, and an arranger and composer and, and performer and a few other things besides. Uh, but mainly, I'm just a human being. I was walking up. Something Jacob is so modestly not sharing is that he's also a five-time Grammy Award winner. And he's only 27. Jacob, exactly how many instruments do you play? Like, what do you have at your fingertips right now, right this second, that you could throw into a song if you wanted to? Oh, oh. Well, I've got, I've got my voice, which is the main one. Ah! And voices do so many different kinds of things. <laughs> and I'm a huge fan. Then I've got this, which is just a, a MIDI keyboard. And I can play notes on it like that, which is cool. I don't know if you can hear this. Oh, yeah. But this is a ba- bass guitar. Uh-huh. So that's a, a bit of a friendly beastie. And let me just pick up uh, this as well. This is, a, this is an acoustic guitar. In fact, it's a five-string acoustic guitar, which is a little uncommon. And so it's what I just described, perhaps plus drums. So you've got things that make rhythm, you've got things that make harmony, you've got things that make melody, and then you've got things that make sound. And within those four families of kind of musical creation objects, I I found myself uh, never bored, you know, never unfascinated by the potential of what music could do. And we should say that you are speaking to us from your home in London, uh, from a very special room where you compose your music. Can you can you tell us about it? Ah, uh, the magical room. Well, I'm extremely lucky in many senses, I feel. And one of those is that I've always lived in the same house for my whole life. This room was where it all began for me. And it's mainly because this is the room where the, the piano lives. And pianos are fascinating things for, for children. Specifically for me, I found it utterly magnetic the idea that you could sit and basically play all music that had ever been made Mm. with these black and white keys. And it was just a matter of uncovering it. And so I spent a lot of time here just just kind of seeking my own goosebumps, I suppose, really kind of drilling into the things that that freaked me out the most and, and made me the most delighted. And I just got more and more fascinated and more and more thrilled by the kinds of emotional results that you could achieve just through sound and through storytelling, all from the comfort of my own home. Uh, I also started on piano, and I was told I needed to practice for 45 minutes every day. And uh, I'm not, I'm sad to say that I don't play anymore, and I hated it. Yeah. But it sounds like you got different directions or prompts. Well, I did. I do remember being offered piano lessons, um, which I, I politely declined. Oh. Very polite, but I, I did say, <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I, I want to keep exploring this on, on my own terms, which was actually really well yeah. received. I, I was essentially brought up by my mum on her own, and, and so she had this kind of extraordinary attitude about learning, which really came from play rather than practice. And I think this is it's an interesting thing to, to think about and talk about, because it's hard to draw the line between those two. And yeah. cer- certain things you need to practice in order to be able to do them. And, and other things, I think, are better discovered through just the process of kind of stiffing out what, what feels really good. And, and both sides have existed for me ever since I began the world of music, however conscious I've been of, of either process. But much to my kind of delight and gratitude looking back, I was really enabled to make my own world and, and design my own learning process in this room kind of for myself. I mean, what you describe sounds like the essence 
of what's wonderful about being a child is discovery and experimentation while you play and wonder. But how have you managed to hold on to that as you've become a professional musician, as you've gotten older? <laughs> I mean, and that is the word that so many people use to describe uh, your music is playful, joyous. Oh, that, that's really lovely. I, it's funny, I, I still don't really think of myself as a professional musician, even though that's, that sounds kind of strange <laughs> to say out loud. I don't think I'm that professional. I, I mean, I, I sort of, there are certain things that I, I've gotten very good at, but I think that in some ways, there's something very sterile inherently about the word professional because it means that you stop learning. And I feel like in general, the more I figure out, the more there is to be figured out. Mm. I don't feel by any stretch, you know, well, I, I've finished that now. You know, I, I don't need to do any more of that because I think that once you've understood a certain angle or a certain corner or a certain kind of concept or structure within it, then it just reveals the one beneath it or, or the, the one above it, you could say. So it's something someone once said, I, I can't remember who it was, but they said something like, you know, the creative adult is the child who survived, which I think is kind of true. You know, I mean, every child, mm. I'd, li I'd like to think, sort of goes into the world of, of education and learning with a totally open mind. And it's very, very difficult to kind of come out the other side with that curiosity intact, because it's exceptionally easy for, for people to shut it down. As kids, play comes naturally. It's what children do. But as we grow older, play gets replaced with work and obligations. We often forget about doing something just because it's plain old fun and because it can spark the unexpected. So today on the show, the surprising power of play, how it can fuel creativity, be an antidote to despair, and even help us find our way in the world. For Jacob Collier, all he wanted to do as a kid was play around with music. And as he grew up, his obsession grew too. You know, I'd, I'd learn a song or, or listen to something or whatever. And I'd bring it back home and, and then I, I, would, I would recreate my own kind of spin on it. Maybe I'd record the song and then I'd, I'd reverse it. You know, and that's always a, a fascinating thing, especially for me when I was like 12 or 13. I used to play a <laughs> game with my friend where we would say a word. You'd say something like, um, good afternoon. And then you'd reverse it and it would be like, <laughs> and then you'd learn, then you'd learn how to say the reversed version. You'd say, <laughs> and then you'd reverse that and see how, how close you were. I love it. Which was a, a really lovely kind of niche game, I suppose. But it was so interesting and all these tools were brand new and, and I didn't understand what on earth I was doing, but I, I wanted to find out. So eventually, all this playing around, uh, it turned into sharing your music with the world online, performing for crowds. At what point did that happen? Well, I would say performance and, and sharing happened at different times for me personally. Mm -hmm. There was about a three or four year window where I didn't play any songs live. I just released them as I'd created them. And those songs back then, those those arrangements and songs were were kind of mosaics of, of, of sorts. You know, there were, there were lots and lots of different ingredients. You've been feeling like you're running away. All combining together to, to make a kind of quite an intricate structure. So it was, you know, lots, lots of different voices and, and, uh, and lots of different stringed instruments and bass instruments and drums and various things that you wouldn't call an instrument, but they are definitely instruments like badminton rackets and saucepans and things like that. So I decided to remember your name. And they'd all fit together to make this tapestry of sound. It's quite hard to play it live. Saucepans, did you just say? Oh, I said saucepans. Do you have Do you have saucepans? We do. We call them saucepans. And so, okay. wait, you're playing those? Yeah. Those are in your room? Are they there right now? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's one up on the shelf here. Um... Uh-oh, are you okay, Jacob? Sorry, I had to, uh, <laughs> had to stand on the piano to get, to, to get it. That's what it sounds like. Ah. It's, it's a good one, isn't it? Kind of like an agogo. Yeah. So anyway, um, you know, the, these things all kind of had their place. But when, when it came to, you know, how am I going to play, these, play this stuff live? It was a, a really interesting challenge because I'd never really considered ha having a, a traditional kind of band. Mm. And I kind of felt like the world I was making kind of needed its own degree of performance structure. And we started to mess around with a few different things. And the first thing I, I really wanted to, to build was this instrument called the vocal harmonizer. And the vocal harmonizer that we built was is an instrument that basically enables me to sing a note and play a number of notes on a keyboard. And what comes out of the instrument is the sound of my voice, but singing all of the notes that I play. So it's kind of like I'm a spontaneous choir. How's everybody feeling today? Feeling good? Fantastic. 
Would everybody, would everybody mind singing with me for just one second? Could you sing something? Could you sing a D? Sing ooh, everyone sing ooh, ooh. Sing ooh, ooh, ooh. Sing louder, sing it louder, sing ooh. Sing ooh, sing ooh. Now please, if you could sing ooh. That's beautiful. Thank you. Well, the one thing we can't bring people listening right now is that you're very um, generous with your expressions when you're on stage. Just the real genuine pleasure you derive from hearing sound. And mm. you can't fake that, no. right? I think you're so right. And I think there's something really effortless about enthusiasm in, in a sense, because as you say, it's either there or, or it's not. And it takes no effort to be enthusiastic about something <laughs> if you if you love it. At least that's that's what I find. It's when I look back at the music that I have made and the music that I, I learned as a boy, a lot of it came literally just came down to what do you like? Mm. Like what mm. what is it that you like? I think it's a question that's not asked enough in in education where someone says, you know, what do you like? What what feels the most important thing to you to make in the whole wide world? Because that's what you'll spend the rest of your life trying to figure out. There is a school of thought where people say, you know, play around, figure out what you love and do that and you'll never work a day in your life. Mm, mm. It sounds like that school of thought certainly works for you, applies to you. But there are some people, I think, right now who are thinking, I have played around and I haven't found my thing, my calling. Mm. You know, I think they, we look at people like you who are so beautifully managing to take play and turn it into work and back and forth like that. There's a melding there. But I wonder if for, for some people we have to say, like, it's okay. Work is work and play is play. Yeah. Oh, it's, it, it's such a tough one. I mean, it is okay to draw a line between work and play. I, I think to say that they have to be one and the same and that that's the only way that life is truly kind of meaningful. I, th I think that puts pressure on in, in a certain kind of a way. There are certainly things I do that are no fun at all and that you just have to do. Maybe it's doing a bunch of traveling and being on early flights and all, all these all these moments you think, actually, this is this really isn't fun. It's not healthy. It's not sparking any joy. I'm absolutely ravagingly knackered and I just want to go home. And I do know mm -hmm. that, that feeling to a point. And I suppose what I'd say is it actually takes very little time and energy to be curious about something. And for me... I feel like curiosity is where so much of of the joy starts. I know those days where my mind is closed and I don't I, I don't feel curious. You have those, those days? Those are the hardest days. Oh, absolutely. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, it was a big lesson for me was was how to how to kind of refine or discover the curiosity and the thing that I felt which was wrong, I think, was I have to kind of rekindle curiosity that I used to feel about certain things. Or, or even just music. I used to love writing songs and now it feels like oh, it's just so much pressure or oh, there's a burden here and I don't know if I, whatever. And I think I think what I realize is curiosity is always new. It always starts in the present and it always applies to the present. Realizing that helped me get out of a, a bunch of ruts. Mm. I think the other thing about curiosity is that, you know, it, sometimes when you're curious, you, you go and create something. You know, you think, I, I'm interested about that. I'm going to write that down. Or I'm going to play that on my instrument or I'm going to teach about that tomorrow in a classroom or whatever. And whilst those ideas might stay, the curiosity moves on and it moves on with your life. You know, you might have signed up for a job that felt like the dream job and the job that would give you all of the joy in the world. And, and a few years might go on and you might think, you know what, I just, I think I've moved and I think I need to do something new. And I think that that's part of being human. Hmm. All right. So, Jacob, we have asked you to play us out of this conversation with a song 
that was born out of one of your moments of playfulness, of, uh, about being curious about something new. What have you chosen to play for us? I figured maybe I'd play the song that I released the most recently, which is one of my most favorites that I've ever written. In fact, it was written in 15 minutes, which is a complete what? whirlwind. And I normally spend like months and months crafting a song. And this was one of the first songs I ever wrote that just kind of went and it popped out. And it's, it's very simple. It's an F sharp major, which is one of the best keys in my opinion ever. I was actually in New York City when I wrote this song. It was just this, this figure, which is so simple. And I just thought, that's, that's nice. And then it was done. I thought, is that it? Do I need to now go and like make a thousand layers and stuff? And I thought, I don't know. But I recorded it on my phone. And then I forgot about it for a few months and I came home and I sat here in this chair and I thought, okay, how am I going to record this? And I thought, well, I've got my microphones out and I sat here and sang the song. And it just didn't come close to the voice memo. <laughs> just didn't come close to it. So I, I released the voice memo in the end. Did you? Yeah, I just released the phone voice memo. And... Um, I'm glad I did because it, it just it reminds me when I listen to it and when I play it, it reminds me of how sometimes it starts with just being curious about the smallest of things. You know, you just grab it for what it is, and you don't. It it doesn't have to be anything more than than what it is. And, and sometimes it's really really plain and simple. And it was unlike any other song I've ever kind of written, and I I, I love it dearly. And uh, it's called "The Sun Is in Your Eyes." The sun is in your eyes The sun is in your eyes Throw me the cold Throw me the cold, cold water Will you smile again To take me by surprise You take me by surprise Throw me the bold, throw me the bold, bold treasure of your lips again, and where I go, you lead me in the right direction, with your love as my protection, I'll be a world of your projection. Singing songs to your affection With rhymes to your perfection In my eyes see a reflection Of you I see you clearly now I hold you dearly now The sun is in my eyes That was beautiful. That was just lovely. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. That's Jacob Collier from our episode about play. Listen to the whole show to hear about an unusual Minecraft world for autistic kids and the founder of something called Plativism. It's all part of our three-part series, Work, Play, Rest. Just search for the TED Radio Hour wherever you listen to podcasts.